I just thought I'd give it just a brief uh, synopsis of the, of the release. The release happened uh, unexpectedly from the courthouse on the 13th of April. And there was uh, a nice uh, reception. I think it surprised everybody and it was pleasant. Uh, Blake Kramer, who has been associated with many uh, witnesses here at Ground Zero and other places who was able to uh, uh, facilitate a, a, a release from the courthouse. I've never experienced that before. And it reminded me of my co-defendant, Elizabeth McAllister, who was all of a sudden told uh, to pack up uh, after she did a, about 18 months of, uh, of time in the uh, jail. Every, if you can picture this, I, I just wanted to diverge just a little bit. Every weekend they would bring in some people to, uh, that were arrested and uh, she would have to uh, help make room for them. So she did for 18 uh, months, almost 18 months, there'd be somebody new all the time in the weekend and fights would start and arguments. And then, but she was a calming influence. She was known as gangster granny. Uh, she was <laughs> nice. uh, approaching uh, 80 years old when she was in. But she was surprised uh, with her release all of a sudden. And I would have been released except that I had a detainer in a place called uh, a federal courthouse called Tacoma, Washington. <laughs> and uh, that's what kept me from, um, even though I, I wouldn't have accepted the conditions of release, but that detainer kept me in for an extra, uh, uh, well, approaching uh, two years. But at the same time too, the sentence that I had was 33 months. And then uh, as, as we, were being transported, I encountered thousands and thousands of people in backlog uh, because of, due to the virus who were being transported either to prisons that they had been assigned to or that uh, they were waiting for some kind of hearings, or they, just thousands and thousands in backlog. So it took me from December 15th all the way to the 13th of April, just simply to have the hearing. And uh, it was, so ironic, the uh, Magistrate Crystal, who, known to people in Ground Zero, uh, was uh, adamant that I appear. But the, the word appear, I guess it was open to a hermeneutic of interpretation. Uh, I was in Baker County when, uh, excuse me, not Baker County, I mean, I was in Georgia when uh, he, was, he told Blake Kramer that I was to appear in Tacoma and of course, my expectation would be how naive I was, of course, my expectation is that I would be seeing him in the courtroom. Instead, I was in the basement of the uh, courthouse in Tacoma and, and told that I would be ushered into the courtroom and I'd be the only one sitting there before a camera. So I came 3000 miles <laughs> to simply sit in a courtroom. I could have done that back in Georgia. It was just uh, tremendously ironic. Uh, briefly, for those of you who, who, who may not be uh, familiar, seven of us went into the counterpart of Kitsap Banger Trident Submarine Base, the uh, Kings Bay, Georgia Trident Base, which of course operates in the Atlantic. And um, we decided that we wanted to uh, try to uh, incorporate, to adopt, to embody not only the Isaiah, prophecy of, of conversion swords to plowshares, but also Martin Luther King's analysis of the triplets of evil, militarism, racism, and materialism. And of course, it was one year before he was actually killed um, that he gave the famous speech at Riverside, where he brought together uh, war making and racism, and uh, always worth further analysis for any students that we meet uh, to, to educate themselves in, in the tremendous uh, stands that were taken at this time. So this was the 50th anniversary of uh, his assassination, the 4th of April. And we went into, uh, we separated in three sections. One went to the, a monument or, or what we used to nickname a display, I mean, a shrine that displayed nuclear uh, missiles, the missiles that are used for the Trident. And uh, uh, one group of us wrote on that, it was actually Patrick and Mark wrote, uh, uh, idolatry, thou shalt not kill, um, etc. And then another group, 
of us, it was uh, Martha and Claire, went to the, uh, the counterpart of Swift Pack. Swift, I, how would you pronounce it? Swift Atlantic, where the, you know, the, the, the gray matter of the, of uh, what would be the, an Atlantic, uh, uh, Atlantic warfare, the coordination of nuclear weapons. And they uh, put up um, uh, police um, uh, tape and uh, poured their blood on the sidewalk there to symbolize that, that the only use of, of this was bloodshed, the only use of the, the tridents. And then uh, three of us, myself, Elizabeth McAllister and Carmen Trotta, went to the nuclear bunkers. So you can see it was uh, quite a conspiracy. Uh, we'd like to think of it as, uh, uh, you know, embodying Isaiah 2, 4. And uh, we were uh, able to cut through the fences, uh, very similar to our action in 2009, where we went to the nuclear bunkers, uh, not th that all that far away from here, after walking all night. Uh, God rest their souls, three, three members of our plowshares have died uh, um, uh, since that time, well, and, and so many others. Uh, Lynn, who was very active in Ground Zero, and of course, Bill Bixel, and, um, and my sister Ann Montgomery, who did the original plowshares in 1980. So I, I'm trying to just bring you up to date on uh, what brings me here. It, uh, 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 it was a three years and a couple of weeks that I spent uh, confined, but I had a tremendous uh, solace that, that uh, folks as yourself were with me. I wanted to also emphasize that the plowshares activists themselves, those who, who take these risks, this is uh, only one piece of a very large piece of which everyone probably listening here is a part of, is that you, yeah, it's, it's, it's an awakening, it's a continuing effort to not forget Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I'm here uh, today, very privileged to see the, the uh, foundations of the are, I, I have to ask, I, I might be stumbling in my terminology, it, it's called a, a pagoda? I, I don't know if that's the terminology, is it? Is it the Northwest Peace Pagoda. The Northwest Peace Pagoda, which I think was delayed in construction from the original founding here. And so it's a privilege to be here to make these connections and that uh, whether you're in education, whether you're in, uh, from anything from medical work to uh, physicians for social responsibility for no matter what line of activism you are, it's all making a contribution to keeping uh, that we never forget, that we keep the memory alive, that these weapons are right now aimed at, um, at innocent uh, people. And so um, it was, um, you know, uh, intensely beautiful time that I've been out. Uh, I've since learned that there's a probably a warrant for my arrest. And um, so I come here, hopefully not to bring any liability to ground zero. There, there's no aiding and abetting here. I haven't even been offered a cup of anything, by the way. I had, I'd have to go get my own food. So there's no aiding and abetting here in, in ground zero. But I did want to uh, take the time to uh, to visit once again in a place close to my heart. I wanted also to say that there are still, the update on the rest of my co-defendants are, they are starting to tumble out. Uh, Mark Koval will be uh, sentenced at the, uh, I believe at the end of the month. Uh, Carmen Trotta has been told he can be at the Catholic Worker in New York City uh, under confinement there, perhaps a, a, an ankle monitor. Martha Hennessy will be, uh, we thought she was going to be able to go home. She will have to go to a halfway house in Manchester, New Hampshire. At least it's closer to where she lives in Vermont. And then uh, Claire, I think the, their unit team in her prison will probably eventually be moving her towards some kind of hybrid situation. And Pat uh, O'Neill, uh, it, it looks like he'll possibly might be kept in Ohio till uh, the fall. Elizabeth McAllister is with her family in Connecticut. So I just wanted to end with um, the sense that in all of this, um, I use the, the part of the prayer that I have was that they, they thought that they were burying us. Uh, they didn't know that we were seeds. 
So I, we're hoping that all of this uh, bears fruit. I know it uh, seems very intimidating, but uh, we have today the witness. We're going to we're going to walk down to the gates of this base. This, uh, as Phil Berrigan would call, this hell hole, and um, create a witness there, reaching out to others who are caught up in this system. And so I think this ongoing campaign here is, is uh, the efforts that are being made here. Uh, I, I have total confidence that the nukes days are numbered. Will it be in my lifetime? That's a very good question. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the days of the nukes are numbered. Yeah, my question is uh, fairly simple. Uh, what exact terms of your probation are you violating? Um, Thank uh, you. And uh, what will happen if they catch up with you? Very good question, very good question. Yeah, I was told to uh, report within three days of the release, and then they will begin to monitor where I live and start paying off restitution, all of those uh, uh, I feel I can conscientiously object to. And then, of course, they will not let me move around, and I'm not supposed to. Is there anybody a felon here? Well, don't admit to it. Uh, I'm not supposed to associate with felons. So you can see that compromises my work. It, I'm itinerant uh, right now. Uh, I have, and there's no source of income, and so I'm indigent as well. So I, all of those things would be monitored, and even drug testing. And by the way, I can't have a gun, so <laughs> I wouldn't even know where to where to store it or anything, but. Uh, so all of those conditions are anathema to me, and I conscientiously object. This is about the third time that, if I may use the underground word, the U word, this is about the third time I've gone underground, and it's usually been broken up by another uh, act of uh, either civil disobedience or another plowshares action. So I've already violated not uh, showing up. Previous one where Magistrate Crystal uh, was involved, is he gave me a certain amount of time for committing a crime while on supervised release, a so-called crime. Uh, we felt, of course, differently about that. Our plowshares action in Georgia was, uh, you know, a manifestation of uh, plowshares Isaiah two, uh, but they of course saw it as a crime, and that is another crime. So you can see that this can kind of compound itself. So. I will. Uh, I would like to not have to go back into the morass of uh, how uh, the COVID and the virus are being handled. When I left, no, no prisoners that I knew of were inoculated. Uh, first of all, welcome back, Steve. Thank you, um, thank you for your witness and for your resistance. Um, you're very much an inspiration to us all here, um, and it's wonderful to see you again. Um, I want to ask something that I actually, you know, I, I think I got. I heard it most from David Swanson, who is, you know, an avowed atheist. <laughs> and then he says, but there's something about those Catholics and, and, and Catholic workers that, that they're some of the best people in the world. And, you know, he admires and, and wants to emulate you all. Can you speak to the aspects of your faith um, and how it relates to your nuclear resistance? Because I think a lot of us say, what is it about those Catholics? Very good. Yes, but I, I'm. Thank you, Elizabeth uh, Murray, for asking the question and reflecting. Uh, yes, a lot of the a lot of the plowshares has been faith based. Obviously, Isaiah is one of the biblical prophets. But at the same time, too, the 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 sense that we have is that we cannot be human while fully human while there is a pact out there to uh, both target let alone actually spend trillions in the past 75 years to make these things. We cannot be fully human while this uh, insanity goes on. So it's a, it's a question of uh, humanizing ourselves and embodying uh, this. I think it's a, a very good vision of political, moral, uh, economic conversion to go from a wartime economy to peacetime production. Uh, we're not out to destroy uh, the sword. We're out to reconfigure it. So, I think there's a, I think there's room for a dialogue in terms of the, what is humanizing, what's proper for us to be doing while we're alive. Um, it's a question always of, of uh, when I'm uh, locked up as to how to humanize 
uh, yourself in, while incarcerated because it's a very inhumanizing or dehumanizing uh, place. I'm kind of trying to be a, kind of a Dan Berrigan clone as a, as a, as a Jesuit. I, I, I don't have the... Um, I don't have the literature that he's produced and all that, but I would like to think that as a religious that I could follow in his uh, footsteps. And he's, uh, it's a very broad uh, pioneering kind of thing that he's done, especially the commitment they made at Catonsville when I was a conscientious objector, trying to be a conscientious objector without much resource. I'm, you know, the, uh, the peace churches had a tremendous advantage but at the same time, there was definitely a, 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 philo a philosophical way out of it. But to make a long story short, in the conscientious objection, the people and Martin Luther King, of course, made this connection. Most of the people being drafted uh, were those who could not uh, uh, could not uh, fight it off, uh, being sent uh, to Vietnam. Uh, people from uh, the poor parts of town being sent 8,000 miles away to kill other poor people. So that connection was made at Catonsville by the Berrigan brothers. And, uh, and, and I thought it was a very good resource when I was a conscientious objector. And then, of course, uh, how to address nuclear weapons. Uh, massive, massive killing uh, was, was a, 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 for me, a, as a faith-based person, a big help. But there have been many, many people who have seen the, the morality uh, embodied in the, in the actions. So that's not the, the criteria. Um, I, uh, I, I do recommend the film that was made by Susan Hagendorn, um, uh, Devout and Dangerous. Um, uh, I, I don't know how its availability is going to go, but I think it, it tells a great story of both combination of faith-based and uh, holding back the darkness of nuclear weapons and, of course, the Vietnam War. I think a person like Daniel Ellsberg would speak uh, to this as well, his motivations. Uh, 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 is there not a great affinity there? Um, and I was just one of the last books I read in, in uh, jail was uh, Howard Zinn's, well, a reader of Howard Zinn, a collection of his writings. And he had a great uh, perspective and appreciation for both the religious and the moral and the, the humanizing qualities. I hope that answers at least somewhat of the question. We, I'm open to dialogue on this at all times. I'm, Thank so, you. Very good. Thank, very you. good. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mask back on here. You're spending a chunk of Mother's Day with us, and I'm really honored to be part of that. Uh, I know something about you already, even those of you I haven't met. I know that you're here on this call because you care about something, or you care about somebody, or lots of somethings, or lots of somebodies, and you want to protect them. So if you'll just indulge me for a second, um, just hold that preciousness in your hands, whatever or whoever it may be. Just hold that for a second. Because the whole point is that we're motivated by love more than by fear. So let's just hold what it is that we find so precious that we want to protect it. So I want to share with you a couple of stories. Um, one is, uh, well, they're both about life-changing events that launched careers for me. Um, so the first one was the birth of my first child. I was young. I thought I was a wimp. And then I did this amazing thing I didn't think I could do. We're talking about this because it's Mother's Day, right? Um, so I had great support and I found courage and strength and surrender that I didn't know I had. Um, there's an amazing thing that happens when you're in labor. You get this cocktail of love hormones, oxytocin and stuff. And, and, then, and then when the pain stops and the baby's born, you're still full of these love hormones and you're in the ideal physiological state for falling in love, which doesn't happen for everybody, but it happened for me and I'm grateful. Um, so that baby came out and they put her right up on my chest, skin to skin, which is now a thing like skin to skin. You go to the hospital, they go, we're doing skin to skin. But back in those days, it was just what hippies did when they had babies. Uh -huh. And it felt so good that I asked, is, is this legal? You know, I mean, it's just it was so, so wonderful. Um, and then she peed on me and then she pooped on me and I still loved her. And I realized that this was a new kind of relationship you know, that I hadn't had before. Um, and I felt like Rembrandt, like, look what I made. You know, I felt really powerful. I felt like I could do anything. Um, and that was good because then I had to raise a child. So, um, 
but I realized that I've been given the gift of a well-supported birth experience. And that's not a gift everybody gets. And I wanted to share it. So I started a career as a childbirth educator, as a labor support doula. I got a couple of um, degrees in childbirth anthropology. I started training childbirth educators. Um, my favorite part of that work was four years volunteering with the Prison Birth Project and supporting uh, incarcerated uh, parents um, through their pregnancy, birth, and early parenting um, separated you know, from their babies, but still pumping their milk in the jail. And um, it was an amazing experience. It was also a front row seat on everything that's wrong with our society. Um, but that, that always lives in my heart. So in every class I do, I do that little exercise that we just did. Um, what's something that you didn't think you could do? Um, and people come up with all kinds of things. I had a couple that had to escape from a swamp full of alligators on their honeymoon, you know, and they did it by just putting one foot in front of the other and holding hands with each other. And, um, you know, they, and then those tools, doing it one step at a time and being with somebody are tools that they now can use for labor um, or for going to the dentist or for anything else that's hard. So um, I like to just encourage everybody to think about what's your personal toolkit? You know, what helps you um, when you are doing something that's hard? So I realized that I'm more awesome than I thought I was, um, but I also realized something else. When I saw her little face, I realized that I have a fierce protective instinct that I didn't know I had before. Um, that was hard because I was afraid for her like I've never been afraid for myself. And, you know, I couldn't control everything that happened to her. When she was a month old, she was sick and she and, and her dad and I moved into the hospital for a few days um, and I couldn't do anything about it. I just had to wait and, and then she got better. And then when we moved out of the hospital, we were homeless um, because we had made some bad decisions that we couldn't control at that time. Um, and um, we lived in a Toyota Corona um, tilting the seats back at night with the baby. And, you know, it, we did that for a while. Um, and then later when she was a baby, I came up against another thing I couldn't control. I was making dinner and the TV was on and the news guy came on and he said, the end of the world, as we know it, news at 11. You know, so I stayed up till 11 to see what that was. And it was, it was the first I'd heard about climate change and global warming. Um, and, you know, I, I couldn't control that. That's millions of people and generations of burning of fossil fuels. And, you know, there's a little bit I can do personally about that, but not enough to really protect my child. Um, and then also when she was a baby, I got more and more aware of nuclear weapons. Um, which I couldn't fix. The Cold War had been raging since before I was born. Um, when I was a little kid, my dad built a bomb shelter and then gave up when he realized that nobody survives a nuclear war. What's the point? You know, he filled it in and we played croquet there instead. Um, and, um, you know, but in the 80s, it was, it was kind of this vague terror when I was raising my kids. And, um, you know, and I would probably tuck them in a little bit too long at night and kiss them a few too many times because I just, you know, I was so scared. Um, and then as an adult, my daughter is a palliative care doctor in a hospital that has COVID and she's working with, you know, dying COVID patients. And especially before she was immunized and had proper PPE and everything, you know, I, I couldn't protect her then either. So that's what it is to be a parent. We fall in love. We, they, you know, they grow and we're proud and we worry. And we try to tease apart the worries we can fix from the worries that we can't control. Um, do you feel that way too? Just wave at me if you ever feel that way. Yeah. So as a fiercely protective mom, I didn't wanna sit quietly and let the obscenities of greed and short-sightedness and dominance and violence and patriarchy be the values that we run the world by, but I didn't really know what to do about it, uh, especially nuclear weapons um, with the power to make everything else irrelevant in an afternoon, to bring on sudden climate change that could starve billions 
Um, even one nuclear detonation by accident or on purpose could cause unthinkable humanitarian consequences. And we have thousands of them on the earth. Um, in the 80s, I was busy freaking out and my therapist was busy telling me to calm down. Um, but people smarter than me at that time were marching and boycotting and divesting. And it helped. Um, it probably saved the world for at least a while. The number of nuclear weapons shrunk. Reagan was rightly convinced that a nuclear war cannot be won and should never be fought. But nuclear weapons didn't go away. There is many, there aren't as many now, um, but they're bigger and faster and deadlier than ever. They're quietly making lots of money for a small number of people and threatening all of us every minute of every day. That's unacceptable to me. Um, there have been a dozen close calls besides the Cuban Missile Crisis. There have been at least a thousand accidents that could have resulted in detonation. We've just been really, really lucky. And that is not a policy, you know, relying on continued luck. Um, so why do we have these things lying around in silos and cruising around on submarines and, and on airplanes pointed every which way? They're stupid. They're expensive, they're dangerous, they're militarily useless. Ask any general after they retire, they'll tell you that. Um, they're inhumane, they're immoral. But what can we do about it? When so many people have bought the big lie that we need these things to protect us from our enemies. That brings me to my second life-changing event that spawned a career, my fourth date with a guy I met online. Uh, he was representing Quakers at the treaty negotiations at the United Nations for the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And his book, uh, Disarming the Nuclear Argument, had been distributed to the uh, negotiators, the, the uh, diplomats. So on our fourth date, he brought me to the UN and I witnessed Article 17, paragraphs two, of th two and three of this treaty being negotiated. And I'm sitting there in the UN and I'm thinking, Oh, this is what they mean when they say this is the room where it happens. You know, I got to tell my grandkids, I'm in the room where it happens. This is really, you know, it was really exciting. Like they were really doing something. Um, and what makes, what makes that treaty special is that it comes from the world. It doesn't come from the nuclear weapons countries. They had the nuclear, the non-proliferation treaty for 50 years and still haven't gotten rid of nuclear weapons. 50 years. You know, they keep promising to get rid of nuclear weapons as long as nobody else gets them and more countries keep getting them and nobody gets rid of them. Um, so this was not coming from the nuclear weapons countries. This treaty comes from the world, the rest of the world who are sick of this and don't want to live with this threat every day. Um, the United States and the eight other nuclear armed nations boycotted the negotiations. Nikki Haley was outside protesting, which was a wonderful turn of events for a lot of people who and the other way around for their whole lives. Um, and uh, it turns out that the absence of the nuclear armed states was a good thing, the treaty negotiations, because they just would have messed it up. Um, so the other thing that made it really special was the ambassador from Costa Rica, Elaine White Gomez, who ran the negotiations. And after a day or two of the traditional speechifying, he said, no, no more speeches. We're going to fix this. We're going to work this out. We're going to negotiate it. If you've ever tried to write a document by committee, you know how hard it is. Imagine hundreds of diplomats in a room. They did it. It was beautiful. Um, the treaty makes everything to do with nuclear weapons illegal. It's a, it's a game changer. And it will have profound effects on the nuclear weapons countries, even if they never sign it. Um, it creates an international norm. It creates a whole lot of stigma. And you know, if the US did not sign the landmines or cluster munitions treaties, but still abides by them, um, you know, this is this is how we got rid of chemical weapons and biological weapons. You know, it's it's really time for the worst one of all to be eliminated. So when it was time to vote, I wasn't in the room where it happens, I was in the UN cafe. But my date, Tim and Wallace, um, was in the room and they had run out of those little plastic earpieces that have the translations. So I was in the cafe on, on my computer texting him the translations of what people were saying. And he was in the room where it was happening. And then they voted. And 122 countries voted to adopt the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. They broke all the rules too. They weren't supposed to like stand up and cheer, but they totally stood up and cheered. They were jumping up and down. They were taking selfies. It was, you know, protocol out the window. It was a, it was a profoundly ecstatic moment for all those people. 
And what really moved me was that there were people in the room who had survived Hiroshima and Nagasaki 72 years earlier when they were children, like Setsuko Thurlow, who some of you probably know. And they'd been working on this their whole lives. And this treaty finally happened. It was beautiful. And it was Setsuko who accepted the Nobel Peace Prize, along with Beatrice Finn, the executive director of the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, the two of them, the two women, one elderly, one young, both brilliant, uh, accepting the prize together was um, was a, a stellar, stellar moment, um, a real boost for everybody who cares about this. Uh, so what, when that happened, I, I said, well, whatever I was doing before, I'm going to do this now, you know, and I asked him, I said, how can we support this treaty in the United States? needs this treaty more than anybody, you know, we, we started this whole thing, we invented these things. Um, you know, what are we going to do? And I, and I said, you know, this is a way I can help healthy families get off to a good start. You know, this is, that's what I've always done. But here's another way to do that in, a, in even a, a bigger way. Um, so I, I have to say that fourth date was so much better than dinner and a movie. Um, so I married Timon. And um, we started three little baby organizations, one of which is nuclearban.us, which does political work, one of which is the Treaty Alignment Campaign, which does educational and investment work. And uh, the other one is called votetosurvive.org, and that uh, is active in election seasons. Um, so there have been other breakthroughs at ICANN besides the Nobel Prize. We are now at 86 signatures and 54 ratifications of the nuclear ban treaty. And that has enabled the treaty to enter into force as international law in the ratifying countries. So um, while nuclear weapons are still stupid, expensive, dangerous, militarily useless, inhumane and immoral, they are also now illegal, Un you know, categorically illegal under international law in the growing number of ratifying countries. We expect as many as 135 countries to ratify in the foreseeable future. Um, we don't know how those countries are going to enforce the treaty because it's new, you know, and each country has to plan its own enforcement laws. Um, but we do know what Ireland is doing and it's pretty, they're pretty serious about it. Ireland, you know, if you have anything to do with nuclear weapons in Ireland, you can go to jail. The rest of your life, you can face heavy fines. Um, you know, if you're an executive in a company that makes nuclear weapons, and you, you know, cross the wrong people in Ireland, it's, they take it very, very seriously because they know the survival of our species is at stake. And you know, good for them. And and may the other countries also enact strict laws. The uh, first meeting of states parties will be in Austria later this year. The countries that have joined the treaty will be meeting together to talk about these things. It's very exciting. Um, so uh, there's all this momentum. There are 607 partners of ICANN, International Campaign to Abolish Wep Nuclear Weapons, in 106 countries, including uh, uh, us, nuclearban.us. And every time we do stuff in the United States, it has an effect on the rest of the world and the campaigners that are working there too. Because you know the US can be perceived as kind of this monolith of militarism and pro-nuclearism and you know we're not there's all of us in this room you know and every time we do stuff in the u.s and campaigners in other countries hear about it it's nice for them and it gives them uh, a, a morale boost so part of our work as ICANN members is we go around to the missions the, the embassies uh, around the u.n and it's really fun. You take your passport and you go to Kazakhstan and you're like in Kazakhstan. And then you go across the hall and you're in Madagascar. You know, um, we went to North Korea a couple of times with our little passports. Um, and uh, we had this fun experience with the, uh, the mission of Antigua Barbuda. They were saying, you know, we, we were saying, well, what will it take to get this, you know, get Antigua Barbuda to sign on to the treaty? It's so exciting because even a little country like Antigua Barbuda has just as much effect as a big country when they join this treaty. So we were asking, they said, yeah, we're working on it, but there's a lot of hoops to jump through. It's going to take a bunch of months and, you know, we're working on it. 
And then we started talking about the things that we're doing here in the US and the things that you're doing here in the US. And I watched this person's face change. And she said, I'm gonna light some fires under some people today. You know, she, it, it, was, it was a magical moment for me. So I, they have since signed and ratified. I don't take credit, but it was a good moment. Um, so um, how did I can get this far in the face of naysayers? They have a clear vision, uncompromising dedication to what's right. They do it together with support. I can people have a lot of fun. Beatrice Finn says, we get stuff done and we have a good time. You know, they just keep doing stuff, trying stuff, and they have fun together. Um, they do dig deep for strength and courage. They do it one diplomat at a time, one partner organization at a time, one country at a time. They don't take no for an answer, and they definitely keep their eyes on the prize. So ground zero also, you know, I want to acknowledge the breakthroughs happening there. Um, I just love ground zero's uh, mission statement, uh, part of which said, you know, exploring the meaning and practice of nonviolence from a perspective of deep spiritual reflection, going to the root of violence and injustice in our world and experiencing the transformative power of love through nonviolent direct action. So there it is again, those tools that we use when we give birth, when we protest, when we go to the dentist, you know, together with support, digging deep for courage and vision, doing it one friendship at a time with the guys who guard the nuclear weapons base, um, one piece of the pagoda at a time, um, one event, one reporter, one publication, one sign on one bus at a time, just doing it, keeping the eyes on the prize. So Nuclear Ban has had some breakthroughs I'd like to share with you. We published, as uh, Mac mentioned, Warheads to Windmills, which I understand there are some copies of there, um, as a way to um, support those who want to defund nuclear weapons and spend the money on green technologies, on basic human need, um, and also as a way to engage climate activists um, in realizing that nuclear weapons are part of the picture. And you know all these issues of justice and climate and and human rights and civil rights, they're all, they're all interlinked. They all have the same root problem causes and they have the same set of solutions. And I think the more that we can work intersectionally like that, the better. Um, and then there was a, 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 there's a, just a wonderful thing that's been going on for a long time, but it keeps getting better, which is Eleanor Holmes Norton's bill, which this year is called HR 2850, 2850. And Nuclear Ban and Women's International League for Peace and Freedom have been um, communicating with uh, Representative Holmes Norton about the treaty and including the treaty in this bill that she's been putting forward since the 90s um, about defunding nuclear weapons and funding green technologies and other basic human needs. If we pass that piece of legislation, we all can take a nap. You know, it's it would be just huge. Um, so that has just just the other day uh, she announced that that's been um, you know, the, the new uh, number as that bill has been introduced one more time. Uh, we've met, we've met with some presidential candidates and their staff. Um, we have legislation pending in the state of Massachusetts. We have some cities that have pledged to join the treaty and have made sure that they're not connected with the nuclear weapons industry in any way. Um, we've taken some actions like you do to notify nuclear weapons companies and military facilities about the treaty and we hand them copies of the treaty or read it to the guards and we tell them you know look you're in violation of international law um and we go to shareholders meetings and we talk to ceos and we write letters to the industry saying you know you need to find another way to make money um you need to ask the politicians who keep voting for you to have money to make nuclear weapons you know you need to ask them to help you find a line of work that's going to be more pro-life, more pro-humanity. Um, and we've done a couple of webinars recently. We did one about how the TPNW, how the TPNW will affect even the nuclear weapons countries that aren't part of it yet. Um, we have an upcoming webinar about pressuring the nuclear weapons profiteers with divestment and direct action and things. Um, our most important project right now 
is getting more members of Congress um, to sign the ICANN pledge. So that is something that we're, we're really excited about. There are 11 so far. They are Eleanor Holmes Norton, Jim McGovern, Barbara Lee, Carolyn Maloney, Earl Blumenauer, Pramila Jayapal, Ro Khanna, Betty McCollum, Mark Pocan, Rashida Tlaib, and most recently, um, Ilhan Omar. And if those are your representatives, thank them. Um, and make sure that they've also uh, co-sponsored Norton's bill. You can find all this on our website, so you don't need to remember any of this stuff right now. Um, so um, uh, we have just hired Asha Ashokan, who is our new uh, director of nuclearband.us. And she just a couple days ago moved to Washington, DC and set up an office. And she is going to be lobbying uh, members of Congress to sign the ICANN pledge and co-sponsor the Norton bill. Uh, and really everything in their power to abolish and eliminate nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. Um, and, you know, we're, we're aiming for 100 members of Congress. If we got the whole progressive caucus, that's 100. Um, you know, and there are lots and lots of ways that you can help do that. Uh, and, and again, I think that's the most important thing right now. The thing is, you know, even even NGOs, even our allies, you know, a lot of people say, well, the US will never take this treaty seriously. But we have 11, we were told we would get no members of Congress to sign on. We have 11, just with a very small amount of effort. You know, what if we had 100? Um, and again, with the national legislation pending, uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton's bill, that is um, you know, a very significant step that, that we can take. That, that means like, yes, this is serious business in the US. And if you learned anything in the past four years, it's that things can happen that we did not expect to happen. Um, so why not, you know, demand a world without nuclear weapons? But how do we keep going when we hear people say, oh, we need to keep some nuclear weapons to deter our so called enemies. Um, and you know, people can't get their heads around total abolition of the worst thing that humans have ever invented. And they call for more realistic, um, you know, small little steps that are more acceptable to the powers that be. You know, when we hit that stuff, that's hard. And we support each other. We dig deep for courage and strength. We do it one workshop, one tweet, one legislator at a time. Um, we keep fishing for solutions. It's like there's a pond and somewhere in there, there's a solution. And we just put in a lot of fishing poles and we see what works. And if it doesn't work, we try something else. Um, or maybe we have to figure out, do we need to keep doing it longer? Um, but we don't like to ask for anything less than the US signing and ratifying the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Because right now, that seems to us like the most efficient pathway to disarmament. So we use a mantra, our mantra is sign and ratify. Um, the US is obligated to sign under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, Biden could do it this afternoon and set the wheels in motion to negotiate with the other uh, nuclear weapon states. And people say, um, you know, well, even if he signs, the Senate will never ratify. But, you know, again, who's to say? You know, these are human beings. This is a man-made problem. People can fix it. We need the imagination. We need the determination. That's it. Um, people say that the U.S. will be vulnerable if we disarm and nobody else does. We hear that every day. Um, our job, of course, is to dispel a couple of myths. Um, the real enemy is not some adversary that we're competing with or some international squabble that we're going to forget in the next generation or even some terrible terrorist. Um, our enemy is nuclear weapons themselves. Um, people say that the US can't or won't or shouldn't disarm unilaterally. But that's not what the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is asking us to do, first of all. Um, there are time-tested step-by-step processes for getting rid of terrible weapons, and we've used them many times. Um, we use them to get rid of uh, chemical and biological weapons. I get rid of one, you get rid of one, we go back and forth. Sometimes it starts with one country acting unilaterally. That has happened quite a few times. And sometimes it happens with a multilateral process. It doesn't matter. Either way, everybody wins when we disarm. 
So what's the best way to support this beautiful treaty in the United States? Ground Zero is really good at that first step, imagining a world without nuclear weapons. We can and we must get rid of these things and we have to do it soon. And Ground Zero is really good at um, persistence and speaking truth to power and reaching deep for spiritual strength. And, you know, thank you, Ground Zero. Um, there are some things that, uh, that we like to tell people about. If you go to, just remember this one thing, go to nuclearband.us and click on join in the upper right hand corner. And you'll be on our occasional mailing list and we'll keep you posted about actions that you can take. That's the simplest thing. Um, so, general things are educating each other. Nuclear weapons don't make us safe or benefit us in any way. They suck resources, including not only money, but brain power. We need those smart people to be working on green technologies. They threaten the climate. The U.S. can and should sign and ratify. Um, and, you know, especially in the age of the pandemic, when we're all so busy keeping each other alive, you know, why wouldn't we get rid of this even worse threat to our survival? Um, one tool I like is a video called What If We Nuke a City um, that ICRC put out. It's, um, I mean, everything about nuclear weapons is terrifying. This thing is a beautiful full color cartoon. It's also terrifying, but it's somehow more digestible because it's a cartoon. Um, it's very well done. Um, another resource is uh, Tim Wallace's um, book, Disarming the Nuclear Argument most of which is on the website, disarmingarguments.com. Um, an, an important thing we need to do is elect a better president. Oh, wait, we just did that. Um, we have a little bit more hope now. It's not perfect. Um, but, you know, Trump actually sent a letter to the ratifying countries of the nuclear ban treaty saying they should de-ratify. Nobody's ever done that before. That was unprecedented interference in international treaty. And at least I don't think our current president will, would do a thing like that. Um, we have to elect legislators at all levels who care more about American quality of life than about uh, global domination or corporate profit, of course. So the specific actions you can take, um, I already told you about the one I think is most important, which is urging your legislators at the federal level, the state level, and the city level Sign the U.S. version of the ICANN pledge to support the nuclear ban treaty. So internationally, it's called the Parliamentary Pledge, and there are lots of members of Parliament all over the world who have done this, even in countries you know, like Italy that hasn't joined the treaty yet, but lots and lots of parliamentarians are saying they'll do everything they can. Um, so the U.S. version is on our website. It's called the Legislative Pledge because we don't have a parliament. Um, and there are a couple of tools on the website. One is a map that uh, this amazing person named James Kolb recently developed where you can click on where you live and it'll tell you who to talk to and what they've already done and what they need to do and what if they are have this point of view or that point of view. You know, it's a wonderful tool. Um, and uh, there's also just a, a page about the ICANN pledge on our website. So again, I'll send this all to you. Um, you can write to President Biden and ask him to sign the treaty. Um, we have a letter on our website. The, um, the connection for it, it says, Dear President-Elect Biden, which we haven't updated, but we have updated the letter since he is now president. So that's there. Um, and then I wanted to tell you about one more thing, which is that we're going to be doing a webinar on June 26th from 11 to 1 Eastern time. And that is called Pressuring the Nuclear Weapons Profiteers. But we'll be talking about investment and we'll be talking about direct action, and we'll be talking about campaigns um, in the media to draw attention to this shameful thing that these companies are doing. Um, we'll talk about ways to contact the employees of these companies and the investors and the banks. Um, you know, that there are only a couple dozen companies in the world that are part of the nuclear weapons industry. And some of them quit at the end of the Cold War because of all the protests that people like you were doing. Um, and the divestment that was happening. So, um, you know, we need to keep going with that. And when enough companies realize that this business is now illegal and it's doomed and they need to shift gears, that's gonna really speed things up.
So um, remember what you hold so precious that you would do anything to protect it or them. Remember how you've done hard things before. Consider how much time you want to put into solving this man-made problem once and for all. Consider what you think might be the most effective, efficient actions you can take with your time. Think about who else might like to join you. Okay, now take a deep breath, everybody. Let it out. That took seven seconds. In those seven seconds, 31 babies were born on planet Earth. So think about what you want to offer them. Thank you very much. I have one thing I'd like to ask. Good. Uh, go ahead, Bob. Yeah. If there's anything that you can think, what is one thing you can think of that you'd like us, all of us to do today in regards to nuclear weapons? Um, that's my favorite question. Thank <laughs> you. Um, yeah, I would say um, go to nuclearband.us slash um, uh, national map, all one word, national map. And you'll see how to urge your legislators to sign the US version of the ICANN pledge to support the nuclear ban treaty. Um, if the map is too complicated to use, it's, it's this beautiful brand new technology. There's an alternative, which is go to nuclearband.us slash ICANN pledge. And there are other ways to, um, to do that there. So, um, and, and I really hope you'll come to our webinar on June 26th, um, but that's going to be really interesting. We're going to have Susie Snyder from Don't Bank on the Bomb and Nick Cantrell, who's a, an expert on divestment and, and socially responsible investing and um, some people who've been doing all this kind of work um, for a long time and know how it works. So um, very excited about that. You know, the, putting the pressure right on the companies themselves, we think is a, you know, could really be a winning strategy because they support the politicians you know, with campaign contributions and the politicians in return keep funding nuclear weapons. Let's break that cycle. I mean, let's get big money out of politics. You know, This is a, a piece of that. This is my favorite part. Um, Tim did all this research and, and made this, uh, this is the, on, the, on the back of Warheads to Windmills. Um, so he mapped, this, this was inspired by a similar study, by the way, in the UK, uh, mapped where the nuclear weapons jobs are and mapped where the green technology jobs could be. And you can see that it goes from black and white to color like the Wizard of Oz. And you can also see that there's a lot more of these than there are of these. There are a lot more jobs and they're good jobs. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's a little paradigm shift and it's a huge economic improvement and quality of life improvement for people in those fields. It's not that hard to convert the same people, the same factories, the same brain power, the same money, uh, the same infrastructure, the green technologies and other things that we need to survive. So um, I, I just love this. Um, so listening to you speak just now, I'm wondering, uh, are you addressing at all the issue of nuclear power? Because um, I think that's raising its ugly head <laughs> as needing to be part of the the transition and the new Green Deal. And so um, how do you relate to that issue? Nuclear power is incredibly dangerous. Um, I mean, I mean, Fukushima is about to release a bunch more water into the Pacific Ocean that's radioactive. You know, nuclear power is, um, well, besides being really dangerous and um, it's also really expensive. You don't get to make nuclear energy without using a lot of fossil fuels and it costs a fortune and there's nowhere to put the garbage. You know, so I think that nuclear power is going to uh, fade away as, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, you know, but the nuclear power energy is subsidized in part by the nuclear weapons industry. And, you know, because the byproducts are used to make nuclear weapons, you know, so it, it is all of a piece. Um, I am looking forward to the day when uh, when those are all shut down and 
and somebody figures out what to do with all those uh, radioactive spent fuel rods. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's definitely related. Our, our particular campaign is focused on the weapons, um, but I don't think nuclear weapon, nuclear power is part of the climate solution at all. I think it's, it's a disaster. So thank you. I, and to all of you who work on that issue, thank you. Well, can I just add the other impact that I think um, might resonate with people is the mining, mm -hmm. the, the front end of it. And the indigenous people have always borne the brunt of, of that process and continue to this day. I understand there's, there's 500 mine sites on Navajo land, mm -hmm. for instance. Yeah, so one they're, thing, they're suffering. <laughs> one thing about the nuclear ban treaty that's exciting is it is it proposes um, making reparations um, for that that kind of damage, um, you know, from nuclear weapons testing and uranium mining. Um, I'm just looking at Tim's book here, and there's um, there's another issue too. It, it it takes many years to develop new nuclear power technologies and many more years to actually build the nuclear power plants. Um, if people are proposing to use nuclear power as a way to address climate change, we just don't have time, you know? I mean, as all, everything else aside, it takes too long and we don't have time to build enough infrastructure for it to make any difference. So just another thing you can say to people who think it's a good idea. Right. I'm reminded of the quote, I think it's E.O. Wilson, who says that the problem with humanity is that we have Pleistocene emotions, um, medieval institutions, and godlike technologies. Uh, Vicki, thank you. Thank you very much for, for spending your time with us. And uh, with that, um, I'm going to push the little red button. <laughs> Say goodbye. Oh.